started. Um, so hello everyone, welcome to the talk today. And I'm so happy to see so many people here. And uh, I would like to welcome Professor Yuan Chong Wang for joining us today. Dr. Yuan Chong Wang, or Wang Yuan Chong in Chinese, is an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Delaware. He works on late imperial and modern China and East Asia. Dr. Wang received his PhD from the history department at Cornell University in 2014. And Dr. Wang's first book here, I'm holding it here, um, entitled Remaking the Chinese Empire, Manchu uh, Korean Relations 1616 to 1911 was published by Cornell University Press in 2018. The book examines China's development from an empire into a modern state through the lens of Sino-Korean political relations during the Qing period. And Dr. Wang's second book, uh, which was written in Chinese, Zhongmei Xiang Yu Da Guo Wai Jiao Yu Wan Qing Xing Shui, 1784 to 1911, meaning um, the meeting of China and the United States, power uh, diplomacy and the rise and fall of late Qing, 1784 to um, 1911. This one was published by the Shanghai Wenhui Press in 2021, last year. And it was a co-winner of the Horizon Prize for Historical Writing 2021 in China. Um, so it's a very rich and well-written book. And Dr. Wan has also published a number of articles and book chapters, and his current research project examines time, calendar, and state building of late imperial and modern China. So it is our great honor to have Dr. Wan here today to give us a talk on his research. The topic of Dr. Wang's talk is from Mrs. Guoliang to Mr. Cushion, the American extraterritoriality in China, which examines the historical process in which the United States obtained extraterritoriality in China in early 19th century. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wang. Well, thank you so much, Professor Huang. I want to show my sincere thanks to Professor Sun for this warm invitation as well. It's glad to see everybody this afternoon. Uh, so, so this uh, I, you got the title is about U.S. China relations. Uh, let me share my screen. So make sure you can see. Share. Can you see the slide? Okay, great. Uh, so my, uh, where's my clock here? <laughs> so this, uh, the theme today, we'll talk about two cases. One is Miss Guoliang, uh, and the other one is a uh, uh, Guoliang incident. Another one is Miss Kusheng's inclusion of a treaty with Chinese part. Uh, this uh, very important event in US-China relations. And mainly because it's about American extraterritoriality in China, in Qing period, Republican period, lasting for 100 years. Uh, I have a, an outline about today's theme, the topic. So this is also about U.S.-China relations in general, as I put here, the, the, the about part. So the 1636 and 1644, at these two years here, this is the foundation part of the Qing dynasty, the last dynasty of China. And 1776, it's American independence revolution. And years after that, in 1784, the first American cargo ship sued for China. So the old China trade started at the United States part. And 60 years later, exactly six decades, in 1844, old China trade ended because China and the U.S. signed the first modern treaty. Since then, I would say uh, the two countries enter a new stage, uh, but we do not call it a new China trade. Actually, it is a new China trade until today, 2022. Well, in 1911, Qing dynasty fell apart and the Republic of China followed. So we know that 30, more than 30 years later, People's Republic 
got funded, and the Cold War was there. Then, till 1972, President Nixon visited Beijing, and uh, the Chinese American side reached rapprochement. Then, seven years after that, in 1979, the two countries formally established formal relationships. So, this is the U.S. China relations outline uh, so far. Uh, today's topic, I have four sections to review this topic. So the first one I'm going to review the Chinese world order is kind of global one. Uh, we call it the tributary system in the Qing dynasty. The Qing dynasty was the last dynasty of China. And the second part, we will talk about the Chinese key trade and the uh, East Indian companies, basically British part, and the global trade and network and American old China trade. So the third section uh, reviews opium trade, opium war, and the change of Chinese image or China image in the West, in Europe and in North America, and followed by the fourth section, which focuses on Chinese American Treaty of Wangxia, the first treaty ever between two countries, and the actual territoriality on the American side. Uh, now let's review the first ones: uh, Chinese world order, so the tributary system. Uh, this system has different terms, uh, like in my book, as Professor Fong just uh, showed to you, in the Chinese America Chinese Korean relations uh, textbook, uh, the book I use term zongfan as to hear the Chinese term, but in English literature, tributary is more uh, popular in today, so you can call it tributary system as well. There's a neutral term called Chinese word order, the China-centric one. Uh, the Qing Dynasty was founded in the early 17th century. Uh, you can see two years here, mainly because the Manchus uh, were the rulers of this dynasty, not really Chinese in the beginning. They founded their own Manchu regime in 1636 in today Manchuri, north, well, the northeastern area. And then seven years later, they crossed the Great Wall to occupy Beijing, beginning their nationwide governance which lasted for more than two centuries until 1911, pretty much 110 <coughs> years ago, excuse me. Uh, so this is the last dynasty of China. As this map shows, this is pretty much the Chinese territory in 1800. So according to Chinese traditional framework <coughs> for foreign relations, uh, China regarded itself as the center of, uh, of the, the, the world. And other countries, technically, uh, according to Chinese discourse, they were on Chinese peripheries, the north, the south, the west, the east. But this dynasty, while well, this existed, pretty much existed on discourse level. In reality, uh, more often than not, the situation went against this discourse. Well, the Qing dynasty was a little bit different because this dynasty, the Manchu dynasty, expanded dramatically in the long 18th century. As this map shows the yellow spot here, uh, I'm facing my extended LCD, but I can see all the yellow. So uh, I'm actually seeing you guys here. So the yellow spot is Beijing and the dashed line is the Great Wall. So this really powerful area is traditionally defined as China, or later we call it Inner China. So the Manchu dynasty they erode in North China here, and then the Manchuria, and the Cross Great War that occupied Beijing in 1644. And after that year, this dynasty became more and more uh, well, aggressive, or you can say it's, uh, or ambitious. And it's crushed the domestic rebellion version and crushed the uh, Southern Ming regime, a regime that went to exile after Ming was conquered, the Ming dynasty, the previous dynasty. Uh, and they also conquered Taiwan, by the way. In 1683, this dynasty conquered Taiwan, integrating Taiwan into Chinese territory. And in the long 18th century, they also conquered the Mongol area, Inner Mongols, Outer Mongols. They also conquered Junga Mongols area in the northern Xinjiang, and the Muslim area in southern Xinjiang, and also integrate Tibet into this territory. So by the end of the 18th century, you can see this China was very different. It conquered Mongol area, Xinjiang area, Tibetan area. It's, uh, it's super large. 
this dynasty was the second largest dynasty in Chinese history ever. The first one was Mongol Empire. I believe all of you have learned this. And within this unit, <coughs> all the people, they became Chinese. Uh, like Manchus, Mongols, Han Chinese, Tibetans, Muslim, or Uyghurs, all of them. Uh, so the Chinese also, because the newly conquered land, like uh, Xinjiang especially, they transport their, <coughs> they transmit their people from inner Chinese area of Manchuria to Xinjiang or other newly conquered area to defend the border. So this, this is the new domestic changes in the Qing dynasty. Uh, which completely reconstructed this, the border of this empire significantly. It's very different from previous dynasty. Today we know that this uh, group, for example, the Sibo people, they went to Xinjiang from, from Manchuria to Ili area today in northwestern Xinjiang, uh, where they guarded Chinese border, defended Chinese border for the entire Qing dynasty. And their descendants are still living there today. Uh, in Manchuria, their hometown, every year they have an anniversary to commemorate this event. So this case give us a general, to here give you a general sense about Chinese reconstruction in the long 18th century. It matters because the border reshaped Chinese perception of the world. Uh, we know that, just I'll show you in the first slide, uh, you might have been familiar with this. If you grew up in the United States, you will be extremely familiar with this. It's manifest destiny, right, to describe U.S. expansion westwardly uh, in the 19th century, pretty much a century after the Chinese had accomplished territorial ex uh, expansion. Now, the American one followed in the 19th century. And this, this, this painting was very typical. This is in 1872 by John Gast. American progress, you can see Lady Columbia is flying in the sky and toward the west, by the way. You can see the native people here, they are escaping from us, their hometown. Behind the lady, you can find the noble peasants, right? These peasants, the farmers. You can see the modern technology, science, and urban theater centers over there. So this, this, this painting gives us a strong impression. The two words, one is so-called civilizational one, the other is backward one or the uh, stagnant ones. So this logic will be applied to many countries, including China. Uh, well, everybody, you are in California, so pretty much they are headed to your, your, where you're standing right now. So the manifest destiny. Uh, this, there's many messages behind, but we know that the, the, uh, at least the, the station eventually they reached was California. Uh, California became Chinese Xinjiang area. Uh, this is defining Americans. Uh, we know that from the 18, 1890s, scholars work on this uh, issue, how the border redefined the United States and defined the U.S. Uh, Americanness, uh, making it different, distinguished from Europeanness. So the border expansion mattered a lot to, um, to America, the United States of America. The same, the Chinese expansion matter a lot to Chinese. Uh, this one occurred to 18th century. Well, the US one occurred to 19th century. However, the two empires shared striking way, uh, striking similarities with each other. You, know, you think about this. I mean, in the New England area, right? And then they cross the Appalachia Mountains and then further cross the uh, Rocky Mountains and then they reach California. So they're like Chinese. They emerged, the Qing Dynasty, they emerged from Manchuria here, just like New England, and then they, they spread, they spread, expanded to Xinjiang area. Pretty much the same process in two different, different uh, centuries. We talk about this mainly because two countries, they were expanding, but they were in the two complete different worlds in terms of diplomacy and foreign relations. Uh, this slide gives us the signs uh, how different they were. When the Qing Dynasty was founded in 1644, when they occupied Beijing, uh, this this just at the end of almost 30 years war between the Manchus and Chinese. The same period, the Western part, the Euro European countries, many of them, uh, ended the 30 years war. In the 30 years war, very famous. 
and then they signed a group of uh, treaties in Westphalia. Later, we call them Treaties of Westphalia or Peace of Westphalia of 1648. Uh, we know all the uh, modern European international law came from this, uh, this event. And pretty much all the terms like sovereignty, border, citizenship, uh, came from this treaty, this system. Uh, and according to this system, sovereignty among countries are equal. So no matter uh, how big country is, no matter how small country is, so the size doesn't matter. Sovereignty is equal. Uh, so certainly, the part of this about today, Russian invasion of Ukraine, is the same. So the entire discourse came from this period. So this Western diplomacy and foreign relations, uh, but in China, it was completely different. Nothing really changed in terms of this. The new dynasty just succeeded the previous dynasty's framework, uh, network, and uh, foreign relations principles. So this new dynasty, just like the previous one in terms of foreign policy, nothing really changed. Uh, very different from, from the Western Falian city. Now, how different in Chinese world, China, so you can say we already revealed how big the Chinese empire became in the long 18th century. Now this empire, just like previous China's, or Chinese dynasties, all of them almost. So in the, uh, uh, from the discourse perspective, on that level, the Chinese court always regarded China itself as the most civilized center of the world. More often than not, the exclusive center, civilized center. So China was the civilized center. Others were barbarous places or less civilized places compared with Chinese one. So this uh, chart gave us a general perception how the Chinese world order worked. China at the center, surrounded by a group of uh, countries, and those countries were defined by Chinese course to be, uh, to be countries of a barbarians or countries of a being less civilized. So this is the uh, framework, the Chinese framework. As I said, it's very different from West uh, Westphalian system that the country's sovereignty were equal. In Chinese world, there's no such kind of principle. Their sovereignties were not equal. The Chinese one was much, much higher and more superior than others. So this is the, the entire system. We call it tributary system. Tributary system because other countries like Korea, Vietnam, they paid tribute on a regular basis to Beijing government, to Beijing court, in return, the Beijing court offered military protection, basically, uh, or security promise to the smaller countries, also give them gifts. So this kind of exchanges, trade followed, of course. They always trade. There were always a lot of trade activities. Uh, so this is the system, the Chinese one, very different from the European one. For century, for more than one century, these two systems they did not have any overlap. Not really, because so far, basically. So the Western, Western Falian principles worked in Europe, while the Chinese one worked in what we call East Asia and Southeast Asia. They did not have any overlap for a long time until the very end uh, 18th century. Uh, so I have uh, several photos. Uh, this, uh, this, of course, this, this recent ones. <laughs> Talking about Liu Qiu, Liu Qiu is today Japanese Okinawa, where Professor Huang is expert on Japanese study. And it's a ceremony to show to tourists, this, this is not real, this is to tourists, to restore the Chinese imperial in Western embassy from Beijing to Okinawa. Okinawa back then was kingdom of Liu Qiu. And they went there to invest the king of uh, Okinawa, of Liu Qiu. And uh, the king, this is supposed to be the uh, Chinese ambas ambassador's uh, invoice. Now this slide, you can say this man supposed to be the king of Liu Qiu back then. And he had to perform certain rituals in front of the Chinese imperial edict, the edict of a investiture, based on which his, king his kingship would be legitimized and officially endorsed by the Chinese emperor. So this is kind of a very hierarchical power relationship. There's no equal relationship. This is, to be honest, the Confucianism does not mention equality. That's not Confucianism. Confucian orders 
which this system was based upon is always endorsed certain hierarchy, but this hierarchy should work well according to Confucius. So you can see this hierarchy over there and he's supposed to prostrate his, his head to, to the entire body, uh, what Chinese called kowtow or kowtow here to the ground towards the Chinese imperial stop over here. Let just give you a general sense the Chinese emperor possessed power over the other kings. So Liu Qiu kingdom was one of them. Korean king, Vietnamese king, all of them should be invested by the Chinese emperor. Otherwise, they would not be legitimate. So this is the Chinese foreign policy. And the Europeans were exempt from this, uh, this uh, order because they were not allowed them. So they came to China mainly for trade and the merchants only, there's no diplomatic representative. So to Chinese, in Chinese eyes, all these European merchants, they were barbarians. Well, again, in, in Chinese text, at least from the perspective of discourse. Like these paintings were painted in 1760 in Kanchen, Guangzhou today, sitting next to Hong Kong. You can see British people, they were painted to be barbarians. Uh, so were French. Now this is uh, the first uh, section we review the different perspective, uh, different uh, orders. Now let's see how the two orders overlap or confronted each other. Uh, this section briefly we review the key and the trade, European or Western trade with China and American old China trade. Uh, we know that there were a group of uh, East India companies and all of them uh, rushed to China for trade, for profit. The most powerful one was British EIC. You know, this also governed in uh, New England for a long time. Uh, so they went to China and uh, treated with Chinese tea. Uh, this, is, this is a long uh, journey, you know. So they bought Chinese tea from South China and they shipped them back to UK. From the UK, they ship further to Boston area. This is the global tea uh, business because tea was expensive. So many smugglers uh, appeared in New England area, especially Boston. And then they purchased tea from European countries and shipped them back to Boston and other areas in New, New England for profit. This tea smuggling business was really lucrative, profitable. And many people were involved, including several founding fathers. Yeah, this is business, you know, simply business. Uh, well, then one thing led to another, as up to here, a British East Indian company they got a huge financial crisis. In order to save itself, they passed the Tea Act. The Tea Act means the tea prices went down. Here's the thing: the East Indian company tea had a good quality. Well, they were once more expensive than the smuggled tea, but now they became cheaper. That would be a nightmare to the tea smugglers in New England area. And they certainly did not want New the East India Company's tea to be distributed here. Therefore, destruction of tea at Boston Harbor occurred. It's mainly because the smuggling tea business would be crushed overnight by British East India Company. Now, this is from this unique perspective you can understand a part of this event. Uh, this is only, again, this is only a part of the picture, not the entire one. And then uh, we know American Revolution followed simply. So one thing led to another, U.S. was founded. Of course, U.S. independence war had many, many reasons. This is what we discuss here from the tea perspective, from tea smuggling business, just to constitute a tiny part of that picture. However, it existed. And uh, the tea that came from China, we you know. This is before United States of America was founded. For example, all the tea destroyed here, they came from Wuyi Mountains, a Fujian province where Professor Huang comes from. It's not very famous. Maybe you should know this much better than I do. So this tea, uh, today we have a clear list, don't list about how many boxes of, gr of uh, green tea, how many boxes of uh, black tea, that it destroyed here. And tea that sort of became a target of a revolution. However, after the United States was founded, uh, they swiftly changed the policy. 
uh, tea became quite famous, uh, well, always popular. But uh, before the U.S. independence, uh, some people argued that Chinese tea was poisonous. If you drink Chinese tea, your American soul would be dominated by the Chinese slave-made tea. So this is a very interesting perspective. And there is a scholar, Carol, Caroline Frank, she discussed this event, uh, kind of voice that was popular in New England. If you're interested, I would encourage you to read this book. It's very interesting. And according to that voice in New England, if you drink tea, the tea was a poison. You're not supposed to drink it. Otherwise, your American soul would be damaged, undermined. And therefore, you would be continuously controlled and manipulated by British Baptism, this, this anti-British monarchy, of course. So the tea became a target of American revolution. And according to this group of people, drinking tea was dangerous. You certainly need to stop. Uh, they have a different argument, but they, they share the same, same points. Uh, for example, uh, Lexington Pong. Lexington, we know that it's the beginning of American independence war. But a year before that, in 1774, this town destroyed all the Chinese tea. Not because they did not like Chinese tea, they did like Chinese tea. The reason they destroyed them exactly because they firmly believe drink Chinese tea. This, uh, this support British monarchy. Uh, therefore, you need to destroy this. Stop letting East India Company uh, making profit of this and uh, stop this baptism. So uh, American War, Revolution War followed and this voice overnight disappeared because everybody loved the tea. Right? They knew this is not a lie. This is just a political discourse. And overnight, this kind of voice disappeared. We know that 1783, they signed the Treaty of Paris. The United States was officially acknowledged by France and other countries in Europe. Less than two months, the Americans sent the first ship to China in 1784. So this is the Empress of China, the first commercial cargo ship of the United States to China, China's empire. Uh, they departed from harbor of New York City on February 22nd, 1784. Uh, the reason, well, that day was George Washington's birthday. So they, they still that day, right? This is kind of an auspicious sign. Uh, see, it's, it's very interesting. Well, it turned out that departing on this day was auspicious because back then they did not know how to go to China at all. They dare start it because it's just, uh, you know, profit to go into China, like Marco Polo, you know, diary. And to go to China to, for, for profit. And they started. They were so fortunate. In between, well, on the way, they ran into a French ship. And French back then, they were, they were allies of Americans. And this ship, Empress of China, simply followed the French ship in reaching Canton. And when it came back, it followed a Dutch cargo ship. And then they figure out how to go to China, how to come back. Everything was so perfect. So everything, I mean, next year you should, uh, you should do something on February 22nd. It's a really good day. And uh, so they, they bought a lot of Chinese tea and they came back to, to New York and they sold them. They earned a lot of money, the dollars. Now it's highly profitable. And that encouraged so many Americans to go to China for the trade. This is the beginning of what we call old China trade. Uh, China trade, but it's old because this is before they signed a treaty. Well, when they went there, they, they had no idea what China was. So in a letter, like today, a passport, they, they put down all the titles they knew. And this just like a basket. You put all the titles in the basket, letting Chinese pick up which one might suit Chinese. Uh, like a most patient, a high, illustrious, noble, all the things. Uh, you can see the title suggests one point only. They had no idea about Chinese administration and Chinese society. And this letter later proved useless because China did not need it at all. And they went to China Treaty and they, they came back and earned money. So all the China Treaty started from 1784, lasting for 60 years when the two countries signed the first treaty in 1844. 
Old China trade to newborn U.S. was crucial because this is the far, uh, well, this uh, long distance maritime trade and the highly profitable, mainly because of Chinese porcelain, Chinese silk, and Chinese tea. All were popular, had been popular in Europe and uh, North America for several centuries. Uh, today, if you have time, travel to New England, travel to Delaware here in this place. You can find a Winchester Museum in our state. Uh, here you find a painting that in 18, uh, the early 19th century, this depict the U.S. factory located in Canton, uh, Guangzhou, next to Hong Kong. So the American merchant, they went to China. Uh, we have a DuPont company located here. And Henry DuPont, the, the West DuPont, uh, this family, of course, they had a um, hall here, became a museum later in the 1960s. If you visit their, their museum, you can find a lot of a thousand, thousand pieces of uh, the tea porcelains uh, and, uh, and uh, the statues like this, like Guayin Avalokiteshvara, uh, a lot, Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, or Guayin in Chinese. Uh, many of them, they, they made for the American customers. And like this, the entrusted by Chinese merchants, designed by European merchants, made in China, and then shipped back to Europe. From Europe, further across the Atlantic to New England. That's why we can see this, this thing here in Delaware now. This was made in the Qing Dynasty, by the way. And this is more uh, conspicuous. You can see it's uh, very evident. The Chinese in Jingdezhen, in Jiangxi province, South China, they also in 18th century, they were interested by East Indian company merchants and they made the same for them like wholesale. And then the East Indian company merchants, American merchants, they would ship this uh, figurines back to Europe or to U US and then they sold them uh, for high profit. That's why today we see them here in the, in the museum. So all of them are marks of uh, US, the American old China trade here. In California, of course, you can find even more. So here, this is China, uh, Chinese uh, wallpaper, the China ballroom, uh, the Chinese style. So we call this style Chinese Li. So referring to an uh, artist, the Zhirang, uh, according to which some saying seem to be Chinese or seem to be in Chinese style, but they were not made in China. So this is uh, uh, what we call Chinese Li. To, not really to present a Chinese nation to local people, to non-Chinese people. So this is called Chinozli. Later, in English literature, we're going to call this Orientalism. You present your stuff to other people, you know, this exoticism, right? Exotic, being exotic all the time. Chinese nation, American nation, Japanese nation. So back then, it's Chinozli. It started from the Jesus missionary in China in 70. Well, 16th century, so long, long uh, time ago. Uh, Chino Zili saying, if you search online, you can find a lot of uh, things marked by Chino Zili. Uh, even today, we still use, not Chino Zili, but a different ones. For example, Hagen Daz, many people here I always ask my students, Hagen Daz, where Hagen Daz uh, is made? So many students of mine saw so this is German or Dutch or Switzerland. No, Hagen Dazs, a typical American ice cream. Uh, because the A look like German language or, or, no, or other language. No, this is American ones. So that A with two eyes just to serve the, the, this uh, other names. <laughs> so this is strategy. So Channel Zli, in return, back then, the same strategy. And then people appreciate the exoticism. So the Americans, of course, just follow European stamps. They, they shipped a lot of items featured, featuring Chinese Li back to the United States. That's why today we can see the figurines like this. Well, uh, like this, the Chinese names. Um, the same period, well, the Chinese image in Europe was going down. Uh, so, so did it in North America. It's mainly because opium trade. Uh, China was a very good country uh, in the 18th century, 17th century, 16th century, even before to European society. But after the 
And after the late 18th century, especially the Enlightenment age, we call it age of enlightenment in Europe, China's image dramatically dropped a decline in Europe gradually. In the early 19th century, it was simply uh, accelerated. So because uh, Montesquieu and a group of intellectuals, they criticized French monarchy and other monarchy in Europe, and uh, they used the Chinese as an example. And they criticized Chinese deputism, Chinese authoritarianism. And uh, therefore, in their books, China changed from a place of a wealthy, of a, of a wealth, of a happiness, of a harmony, to a place that mercilessly governed by a dictator, a despotism, it's a despotism society. So China became a negative part for despotism, for bad governance, bad governance. Uh, so the Chinese image in Europe started changing dramatically in the second half of the 18th century. One thing made a contribution to this. Uh, it was Mark Curtin's embassy to China. In 1793, simply started. The British one, they went to China, they tried to negotiate with Chinese empire for more trade network, but the Chinese refused. And this one was, was uh, this one feud, the mission feud. McCartney, Lord McCartney, this is a very famous mission to China. And uh, because of this, so in Europe, some uh, countries, Britain certainly, and other uh, countries, they started calling China a stagnant society, an immobile society, because they refused to open his door, so called open his door to Western civilization, to European civilization. Uh, the, the slide here, you can see this was a boy, uh, George Thomas Staunton. He was a boy, 12 years old. He went to China with his father who was the first secretary to Lord McCartney. Here's Lord McCartney, his father, his father here. So he's the man of, uh, of George Staunton. So George Thomas Staunton. Thomas was 12 years old and he enjoyed the trip. And on the trip to China, he learned some, some Chinese language. And then when he reached China, he was able to communicate with Chinese high-ranking officials in Chinese. The Chinese emperor was shocked. And it was fond of this boy. Right? Look, this boy was really sinicide. <laughs> he liked Chinese, civilized this boy. And the emperor back then, over 80 years old, liked the boys, I mean, all the children. And the boy uh, enjoyed the appearance as well. Later, this boy, who met Emperor Qianlong in 1793, emerged as the most important sinologist of the entire British Empire. He was the first sinologist who understood the Chinese language and who was able to introduce his English, Scotland, well, British counterparts to Chinese civilization. He loved Chinese civilization and he became a secretary of a East Indian company located in Hong Kong area. However, he grew up in Europe and he had this civilization hierarchy set, uh, mindset. So he firmly regarded European civilization, British one, as civilized one, while the Chinese one was the, the less civilized one or uh, stagnant one. So in 1821, this is what he put in uh, the introduction preface to his translation of a Chinese diary. He said the Chinese, the Chinese uh, would rank very low indeed in the scale of civilized nations. Now, according to this British gentleman, now the Chinese civilization, as well as Chinese people, were ranked very low indeed. So what happened, uh, partly because his own appearance, later he served a secretary for another mission, but viewed it again. And he was really frustrated. And then he figured out, well, something, something between, and they needed to know the Chinese better. So because the East India Company treated with Chinese, and later he translated the Chinese law, Chinese law, uh, especially the penalty code, the penal code of Chinese law, part of the Chinese law. And he was the first person who translated Chinese law into English in order to protect British merchants and the European merchants. 
So here we say the extraterritoriality uh, started, but not yet. It's just the beginning of the law cases. Uh, we, we know that later British engaged open trade because they could not uh, reap a lot of profit from traditional trade, tea, porcelain, silk. Eventually they figure out opium. Opium would be highly lucrative. And they started opium trade. Uh, opium trade, uh, they planted, harvest, refined opiums in India and transport them to, to China. So they told the Chinese to smoke it. The Chinese had used smoke, uh, opium for centuries. It's not new stuff to Chinese, but nobody smoked it. Uh, it's used as medication, but now it became a drug. And they taught China to smoke it and gradually this became prevalent, the drug OT uh, problem, the, the crisis, nationwide ones. Now from this slide, you can see how much opium they shipped to China. Uh, well, they know this wrong, but still they continued. And uh, the British knew, uh, the Chinese regarded opium trade as illegal, uh, but they could not stop the British and Americans and other European merchants from smuggling them to Chinese part. Uh, many Americans and uh, British merchants engaged the opium trade. The American side, for example, the families, uh, the four base family, the Perkins, Peabody, Russell, Lowe's, and a group of others. We know today there's still four base magazines. So four base family has relationship to the opium trade in China. And this group of young American merchants they regarded the Chinese man, uh, Hao Kua, as their godfather, their Chinese collaborator. You know, there's always drug dealer business, right? Not two sides, not just one side. And drug uh, business became very popular. Uh, this uh, simply happens. Uh, some of them were punished by Chinese government, but many of them they just escaped from the law of persecution. Now, in this background, uh, here came today the major event. Uh, Miss Guoliang, uh, Miss Guoliang. So her family name before marriage, uh, the maiden family name is Liang, but after she got married. Uh, she took her husband's family name as well. So this is Guo, so Guoliang. This is a traditional way to address Chinese women. It's certainly gender discrimination involved. Uh, this, uh, this one. Well, today it's International Women's Day, by the way, but this day did not exist in China so <laughs> before 20th century. I mean, it's the case. So the Miss Guoliang, he was a Cantonese ordinary lady uh, ordinary woman, and uh, her business basically was going to the river where many foreign merchants, uh, their cargo ships uh, harbored. You can see from this uh, painting, a lot of Chinese junks here, small junks, and this is British and Dutch, American, others, the, uh, the cargo ship, bigger ones. The foreigners, foreign sailors, the, the uh, crew, they need fruit, fresh water, chicken, duck, other things. So her business was to trade with the crew, with the foreign sailors. So normally, so that day she came out again, trading with with American ship uh, ship, the so Emily ship Emily. So uh, ship Emily uh, was an Italian sailor. His name was Francis Terranova. Terranova tried to buy some fruit from Miss Golia. And he lowered his jar, basically, that's what they did normally. They lowered their jar and uh, put the money in the jar. So Miss Golia would pick up the money and put the fruit or other stuff in the jar, then they, they get it. But that day, something, something went wrong. And uh, suddenly, Miss Golia fell into the water. And then people got her out and found that he already died. And his head, there was a hole in his head. And then everybody back then, they made a concern immediately. It must be that foreigner uh, who killed Miss Golan. So Francis Terranova now became the major suspect. So the American back then could not, could not protect him uh, simply because two countries didn't have uh, treaties. And the Americans actually, cooperated with Chinese translators from Kohang, the local factory 
and Chinese officials in Canton City. So this uh, figure here stands for uh, American, uh, Chinese officials. So this is my own painting, which is awful, but give you a general idea of what happened. <laughs> like kindergarten level drawing to show the major event. So they negotiate with each other. Eventually, the Chinese officials, the judge, uh, they actually hold, uh, hold several uh, conversations with the American side. And uh, uh, Terranova was called to Canton City, where he was on court. And then Chinese side eventually judged that Terranova was, was the one who killed Mr. Guolian. And according to Chinese law, he should be executed by Chinese. The Americans could not defend him because there's no law at, at the American side. And more importantly, Sheba Emily had many opium inside. If Chinese discovered this, the entire thing would not be just this uh, homicide, but also the illegal opium trade. The entire case could become more, much, much more complex and complicated. So the Americans simply compromised and they believe Terra Nova killed the Chinese and then he should be punished. So the Chinese law ruled that he should be executed. And then uh, one day he was found to death. Here, this, uh, this is Stanford Terranova who was killed by the Chinese side. It's uh, sad, of course, and he can, uh, he's sad. But this is the case. Now, after that, second day, everything became normal. The American continued to treat with Chinese. Chinese uh, treated American pretty well. Terranova's body was de delivered back to the American ship that he was buried on the sea. So this is the case, uh, Mr. Golian. So Terranova was killed based on Chinese law, which said that if foreigners violate Chinese law in China, so they would be prosecuted as Chinese. So this is how he was killed. And back then, there's no dispute between the Chinese and American sides. Americans agreed with this, uh, this result, and Terranova died. This occurred 20 years before Opium War, almost 20 years, 20, 21 years before that, before Opium War. And uh, an Italian sailor on an American ship was killed by Chinese, according to Chinese law. This, this is Mr. Guolian's case, and Terranova, very unfortunate, at his own end was killed. But according to Chinese law, he deserved it. Now, Opium War, 20 years later, Opium War broke out. We know that China was defeated and the British signed the Treaty of Nanjing with Chinese in 1842. So this was the first uh, treaty that the British Empire signed with Chinese Empire. Until today, Chinese regarded this as an equal treaty. So this is 1842, they also opened a more uh, ports for treaty, uh, for trade. So we call them uh, treaty port because they were opened uh, based on the treaty. And the Chinese also ceded Hong Kong here, ceded Hong Kong to British hand. This is uh, how Hong Kong became a sensitive issue. Since then, in 1842, Hong Kong was ceded. So the first opium war, I believe all of you have learned this, even in K-12 education. Uh, well, a year after that, the two countries signed another treaty in the tiny village called uh, Bugo, or Human in Tibet Chinese, the Tiger Gate, literally it means. So this is a supplementary treaty to, to Nanjing Treaty. Well, but based on this treaty, Article 6, as I put here, the British Gained a right or privilege. The privilege we call it consular jurisdiction. This means, uh, generally speaking, if a British subject commit a valid Chinese law, he or she would not be prosecuted by Chinese law. Rather, this British subject would be would be prosecuted by the British Council in China, and it would be punished by the British Council only, not by the Chinese side as I put here, they shall be seized and handed over to British Council for suitable punishment. Suitable punishment, according to whom? According to British side, even not the Chinese side. So this right, we call it consular jurisdiction because basically based on council. 
not an ambassador consul. So the uh, consular jurisdiction is part of uh, extraterritoriality, this term. This is the term in international law, extraterritory. This means beyond your territory. territory. So extraterritoriality refers to the right that a certain country's citizens in local country are exempt from local law, extraterritoriality. So this is the uh, distinguished feature or characteristics of an equal treaty. This was completely imposed by British side upon the Chinese side. And this is why we call this policy a uh, gambled diplomacy, the gambled one, the gamble back then, because they have the gambled, they defeated the no local country and they signed a treaty. Through the treaty, they imposed unequal terms through which they gained more privileges. This is a policy known as gunboat diplomacy. So the Opium War and the Treaty of Nanjing were textbook level cases, gunboat diplomacy. You might have never heard of this in Quito because the US doesn't have that appearance. China had, and China had a lot. China had more than one century. So for those who grew up in this country, you need to understand Chinese empire and American empire, or simply China and the US, during the second two centuries, 200 years, had a completely different courses. The US side is an ever increasing, growing power, while the Chinese one, the West, went down dramatically. That's why in China, after 1842, uh, the Chinese call it is one century of humiliation. Well, the United States part is one century of a prosperity. It's very different. This basically confines your understanding of a modern history. As I said, the U.S. doesn't have this appearance. This is sometimes it's really challenging for, for these people to understand why the Chinese response to certain events is so sensitive and even so dramatic. If you understand this background, you can understand better today Beijing government discourses. Well, this actual territoriality. Uh, well, now another one they also gained from the treaty is most favored nation clause. This means one country signed a treaty with China, the other countries automatically obtained the same privilege. So this helped European countries and the uh, United States to form a kind of a joint imperialism, joint colonialism, China, colonialism back then. Joint, the joint business, you know, the most favored nations. Uh, so this uh, British treaty, 1842 and 1843, uh, now came the American part uh, briefly. It's very easy to understand this part because we already finished the, the, the thing that we should talk today. Uh, this part is very easy. Uh, Kushan, Caleb Kushan became representative of the United States and he went to China for a treaty uh, appointed by President John Tyler. He went there he negotiated with Chinese representative, the Qiyin. <coughs> very soon, the Chinese did not really negotiate much with the Americans. They just simply agreed, signed a treaty with them because it's the Chinese way in their own diplomatic framework. Since they signed a treaty with British barbarians, now came the American barbarians. They should give American side the same thing for balance, for fairness. So the Americans were really shocked. There's basically no negotiation. The Chinese give us everything. They're really, really terrible, I mean, according to today's standard. But back then, the Chinese were also glad. Look, no trouble. Then they signed a treaty. This is exactly the first treaty between Chinese empire and American empire. 1844 in Wangxia, a, a tiny, tiny village north to Macau. <coughs> the first treaty between the two. Uh, back then, the American doctor in Guangzhou, Peter Parker. Peter Parker uh, was a good guy, really enthusiastic. He understood Chinese and he served as interpreter between the Chinese side and American side. And he drafted many letters for Chinese side. So eventually they signed this treaty uh, of Wangxia and Chinese were very glad, also wrote a letter to to American president, the so American president had a written letter to Chinese uh, Chinese uh, emperor, uh, John Tyler. Well, of course, 
Peter Parker was smart enough to change the discourse in accordance with Chinese law and Chinese research. Uh, well, in this treaty, Article 2, the American side got most favored nation. This means U.S. also obtained all the British, uh, uh, all what British had obtained in Treaty of Nanjing, all of them in Treaty of Nanjing. And oops, where, where is it? So this is uh, the American side. Uh, not one is extraterritoriality in China. So the Americans uh, in Article 21, this is much, much longer than Treaty of Nanjing, this uh, American side. Uh, they also wrote that America also enjoy this extraterritoriality in China. Basically, after this point, after 1844, American citizens would be exempt from Chinese law. The Chinese law was not able to punish it. So Miss Cushion was criticized by many Americans because this was not, he was appointed by John Keller uh, when he was appointed by John Keller uh, to do. He was not supposed to sign this one with Chinese because this against the American Republican rule principles. However, he justified his own decision. He said, this, this uh, equality or this law, Christian law, should be practiced between Christian nations, not the Asian nations, not the nation like China. China is not a Christian country. Therefore, uh, China should not be treated equally. That's what he meant, basically. This is based on the hierarchy of a civilization. And he used this uh, theory, this logic, to justify why the American upturned extraterritoriality in China, which was apparently extremely unequal. Uh, but later, America embraced this, so the, the extraterritoriality continued. As you can see, the, the painting here show the last addition to the family. The family of what? The family of the civilized nations. So this is what it means. And this certainly is supposed to be the Chinese baby, the Manchu baby. And this lady, Columbia, again. Now go back to the painting we talked about in the beginning. This is the same mass, you know, the same, exactly the same. The one thing led to another, uh, this, uh, this uh, civilizational hierarchy uh, continued. And by the end of uh, uh, 19th century, we know that uh, many things happened and the uh, white man's burden also uh, occurred. So a lot, this is uh, exactly what we know in history. But back then, the Chinese had a very different understanding of extraterritoriality. The Chinese understood it as a good article a good article because the American managed Americans, British managed American, uh, British, right? It's good, trouble free. So they did not have the sovereignty or, uh, or the address of sovereignty concept, uh, not at all, because international law was not introduced to Chinese yet. The first international law was introduced to China until 1864, so quite late. And then Chinese learned the entire Westphalian system, the norms of state, nation, country, border, borderland, sovereignty, citizenship, and a very diplomacy. All the same were new to Chinese. Before that moment, they lived in Chinese world. They didn't know what's going on. So this is the old China trade. You know, this trade, this is about trade, but this trade was conducted when Chinese had learned about international law. And this exactly in this period, in 1844, the United States obtained extraterritoriality in China. So technically, this means if an American citizen killed a Chinese subject in China, he or she would not be persecuted by Chinese law. This one applied to all foreigners in Shanghai living in settlement, Shanghai settlement, American settlement, British settlement, and French concession. French settlement. So extraterritoriality exercised here for almost 100 years. Now you can see the Shanghai International Settlement had two parts, British and American settlements. So British and American citizens, they were exempt from Chinese law 
until 1943. Uh, uh, the major reason is World War II. China became an ally of the United States. And certainly this extraterritoriality did not work well for the friendship. And then on November 4th that year, the two countries negotiated and abolished this extraterritoriality right of the United States in China. So from 1844 to 1943, you can claim this exactly 100 years or 99 years, 100 actually, 100 years, 100 years long extraterritoriality in China of the United States. Other countries uh, still enjoy that until 1949 when the Chinese Communist Party was uh, founded, the, the People's Republic. So this is American part, 1942. Uh, it's quite a long history, of course. Uh, this is not unique to Chinese. I put here in Japan, they also signed a treaty. Uh, for example, this uh, Kanagawa, the, the treaty. In this treaty, they also got extraterritoriality in Japan. So we need to know that US extraterritoriality was not unique to China. It's to a group of country in the so-called Far East, China, 1844, uh, Samnese, 1856, Sam is today Thailand, and then 54 uh, Kanagawa Treaty in Japan, and 1882 in Korea. So this is a network, a network protecting American citizens in Far East. Uh, this certainly based on the logic we talk about, gunboat diplomacy, which U.S. itself never experienced, but China is quite, quite uh, frequent in the 19th century. And the relinquishment of this right also marked the friendship of the two uh, sides, United States and China, in the war context. Um, but this one was uh, relinquished, but not all of them. We know that later. Uh, United States passed Chinese Occlusion Act. So this one was later uh, relinquished quite late in the 1960s, uh, after the actual territoriality was uh, lifted in China. So this is a U.S. domestic policy, of course, but it's targeted to Chinese immigrants and about, this is also about uh, the U.S.-China relations in the long 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. Uh, but in terms of uh, the extraterritoriality, this uh, lasted for exactly one century. Now, uh, this, uh, what I want to present today, go back to the very first uh, stage. Uh, we know the background, different diplomatic framework, and we see the trade from the economic perspective, and then the opium trade got in, China's image uh, clamped it, went down, became a metaphor for stagnant, immobile, deputism, deputistic societies. And then uh, the anti-Chinese resentment also emerged in the Western part. And then we learned how the U.S. eventually obtained extraterritoriality in China. So after that case, we go back to the Guoliang, the Guoliang case. We would say after 1843, 1844, no such thing happened ever because actual territoriality. Even if an American, even not an Italian sailor, even if an American sailor killed a Chinese, Chinese citizen, he or she would be punished only by American consulars, not by Chinese law, certainly would not be killed like Terra Nova. So this is the, what territory, uh, actual territoriality means. And this is certainly a really complicated part uh, of U.S.-China relations in this period. Okay, thank you so much. If you have questions, just let me know. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang, for such a wonderful and clear um, lecture. I, um, I believe I speak for everyone when I say that, that I learned so much from you. I feel like I've heard um, some of the uh, incidents or treaties um, before, but your lecture definitely helped me put all those events back to the context. And also I've learned so much about the European side. 
on the other, it feels like the other side of the coin. So um, I really appreciate your uh, lecture. So we have about 25 minutes left. So um, I would like to open to the floor and uh, see if um, from the audience, if anyone has any questions. I don't see anything in the Q&A or chat. So please, um, if you have any questions, you could just type them in the chat or Q&A or just raise your hand. So we will, um, we will um, enable your, um, your, the function and then you can directly talk to Professor Wong. <clears throat> Welcome. Any question? Mm -hmm. I hope this part is not too confusing to you. <laughs> I do myself do have a couple of questions, but I would like to wait until the end if we have time. Um, yeah, because I know that you um, you are very busy. Um, so we I'm thank fine. you for. Actually, I'm uh, relieved <laughs> from today's assignment. So I'm good. So we appreciate your time here. And uh, because of Zoom, we, uh, we can afford inviting you here because otherwise we wouldn't have, have had the opportunity to you know, listen to your talk. So- um, Thank you, appreciate that. Let me see if anyone raised their hand. Oh, maybe Professor Sun. Oh, <laughs> maybe the okay, start um, I will start with, uh, <laughs> with a pretty simple, question. Um, during the talk, you talked about uh, uh, when you talked about uh, the Goliaths and uh, death and aftermath, you talked about one of the wealthiest merchant in Guangdong called Wu Bing Chen, Wu Bing Yan. Um, you said he was um, probably the most uh, you know rich richest person in the in the whole world at the time. And uh, he had a lot of money. So I want to know a little bit more. So, how he got his money? Is it mostly from the trade for the opium or something else? And what did he do with his uh, load of money? All right, it's a good question. I think this guy certainly <laughs> accumulated. Let me see, share this. This uh, let me give you things. This is a uh, Bing Jian Hua. So his major business was Kohang uh, factory that uh, Chinese official broker between the Europeans and the uh, uh, Chinese side. So that's his business. He served as official broker between the two sides and he accumulated a uh, remarkable wealth. Uh, but later he also engaged opium trade. Uh, the biggest one was the British part. The second biggest opium trader was the United States. And uh, in this place, he certainly helped, he basically helped this uh, uh, European and American drug dealers to distribute their, uh, their, their drugs among the Chinese society. And in between, he earned a lot of money, uh, accumulated a lot of silver. And then he became one of the richest persons in the world back then. So people basically argue that he might be the richest one back then. So from official broker business, the trade business, plus the opium, the drug business. So these two branches uh, made this uh, a super, super rich uh, millionaire back then. And uh, he spent money. Well, this is a very challenging question because he it's very different from his American drug cooperator or, or collaborators who invested money back home in the United States to many other fields, universities, a hygienic enterprise, a social welfare, he barely engaged this, uh, this field in China. So we, we actually don't know how he spent the money and where the money went eventually after he died. Uh, simply, I, I get this because Chinese society, he was a merchant, he purchased a certain official rank, as you can see this uh, imperial, this uh, official robe actually, but he was not an official. He used the silver to purchase an official rank only, and it became quite influential in the local financial world. Uh, but because the Chinese uh, official system, he could not invest a lot of money to other fields. And that's certainly not the Chinese way. Uh, hospital, for example, there was no public hospitals in China, by the way, and uh, no philosophy uh, or human. Uh, Humanity studies research, not at all. So he got a lot of money, but he barely invested to this field. Uh, 
uh, we don't have many uh, many details about the use of his money. However, one thing uh, is for sure that he did not invest this uh, silver to this business like his uh, American partners uh, did in North America. Yeah, that's uh, really good to know because um, remember he has that much of money he could do, he could have done a lot of things with um, that money. And given his knowledge of the West, you know, science and culture, and he could have done a lot of work by right. investing in education, in charity, in even public um, affairs. But we didn't even know what he did. <laughs> we just knew he had a lot of money. <laughs> right. I mean, if he, for example, created a Hokkua University, today I would say it might be one of the most elite universities in the world. Unfortunately, that's not the Chinese way. So, yeah, very unfortunate. Actually, even today, we know the Chinese, well, I'm not supposed to say this, but I guess you can say the similarity between the American uh, uh, American entrepreneurs and the Chinese entrepreneurs. They, they have very different approaches. Yeah. So I, I'd like to ask a follow-up question. So because you mentioned about uh, billionaires in China today, and they didn't really spend a lot of money on maybe public uh, things. So what is the, the difference between the Chinese um, wealthy people and uh, Western, especially American wealthy people? And is that due to the Chinese you know, social society, you know, social rules or political regime, or due to some personal um, beliefs or habits? Yeah, this is a really good question. I think we have to address it from perhaps from the last speaker perspective. Uh, then we have to go back to the Chinese Confucianism and other ism and how the Chinese society worked. Uh, we know that the, the Chinese society is a highly uh, hierarchical from many perspectives in many ways. And uh, he certainly, like in Wu Bingjian time, he certainly could not do that. Uh, today, there are certain rules. You're not supposed to touch the bottom line of, uh, of the government, I guess. So back then, Wu Bingjian was not supposed to touch the official business, like establishing a modern college or university or even public hospital. Uh, so this, uh, I think the major reason is the fundamental difference between American uh, European society and the Chinese society. It's super very different. And this back then certainly was not unique. Uh, Japan, for example, before Meiji Restoration was not able to do a similar thing. Some of the just uh, got locked in certain social status. And uh, some of you know, theoretically, if you master order, you kill yourself, you had to follow it all. But certainly this, this is the rule. So the Chinese society practiced a similar similar principle. And in that highly hierarchical society, merchants, entrepreneurs like Wu Bingjian were smart enough, and, it, and it, his counterpart today are also smart, equally smart, even maybe smarter. Uh, this is finding out certain boundaries. You certainly do not cross that boundary to do the thing that you're not supposed to do. So we complain, we even limited, we just limited that Wu Bingjian did not do many things that he could have done. However, on the other hand, he knew this. He understood China much better than we do today. There were a lot of reasons that he didn't invest, to do, invest the money to this field. Otherwise, a smart merchant like him would really uh, exaggerate, uh, well, would just, uh, uh, just uh, make more profit by, by investment to this, this field. Uh, so I think we have to go to the social structure of the two societies, then and now. This is my, my two cents. Yeah, thank you, that thank helps you. a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, uh, by listening to your conversation, I, uh, I learned a lot. I always like to talk to or listen to historians because you, got, you always have so many stories and you know, pictures. Uh, I see a question coming in in the Q&A from my colleague in the um, business school. Um, 
Professor Yue, Yue Zhang or Jeff Zhang. Um, Professor Wang, would you like to read it yourself? The question uh, sure. is pretty long. So everybody yeah. can see this, right? Yeah, I think so. So, uh, Professor Jones, it's a good question and uh, a question that scholarship has discussed for decades, um, especially in the late 20th century, after China so-called opening up and reform policy started. So the question, uh, even Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao also raised a kind of a similar question asking why the Chinese, well, he made a concurrent, of course, the Chinese did not develop into capitalist society. So Professor John asked this modernity and uh, Chinese traditional society, uh, if uh, the Qing Empire uh, able to develop into the modern society. So here I, I want to say that uh, I want to articulate first uh, the standard of a modern. So this modern based on European part, this uh, completely kind of a European, Europe-centric uh, understanding and standard. So by modern, basically we learn, uh, we, we mean that the local society, local country uh, was so-called open by European or American powers like uh, Opium War opened China's door, uh, uh, Matthew Perry opened Japan's door, things like this. Then we put the standard of a modern and a modernity to 18th century European standard, pretty much after French Revolution. So being progress, uh, always being progress, and uh, Darwinism or social Darwinism in late 19th century became more popular in China. So this is about standard modern. Uh, when, you, when we have this dichotomy, the two parts, traditional and uh, modern, so Chinese, Chinese part is regarded as traditional or traditionality, and the Western part regarded as modernity. And then basically we frame the question in this dichotomy, in this framework. The uh, question here is, if there are modern thing, and this is like what John mentioned, the globalization. Now I want to go back to a part that I actually did not mention today. Uh, however, in Chinese history, especially in late, uh, in, in recent history, it was very popular. Uh, I guess, I guess I didn't put here. Uh, this is about the Jesus missionary to China, who went to China in late 16th century. And from late 16th century uh, to, to the early 19th century, a group of uh, European missionaries always worked in Beijing and they cooperated with Chinese counterparts, Chinese colleagues. So they introduced Chinese to modern uh, European science and technology. They also work with Chinese to make modern calendar, to build a lot of stuff, to make land survey and uh, produce the modern map. Even from the cartographical perspective, China produced modern maps in the 18th century. So the globalization had been there for a long time. Uh, the, the one after Opium War was simply a new one. So the Chinese had been engaged had been, had been participating in globalization before the Opium War. So uh, it's really up to our understanding of a uh, definition, uh, our definitions of, uh, op of uh, globalization uh, modernity. Uh, go back to Professor John's question specifically, uh, if the, the due a chance for the Qing to develop, I believe it will be because this kind of a, a trend that the Qing would not be exempt from. Uh, not just the Qing as we covered just now, uh, Siam, Thailand, Vietnam, Korea, Japan, even Ottoman Empire, Turkey today, and many, many other countries. So they engaged in this globalization. It's just a matter of time. Maybe not a gamble to diplomacy, but sooner or later they're gonna change. Uh, to Chinese itself, I, I also believe it would happen. So we talk that after Opium War, everything modernized, right, or globalized. But from the, the for example, Professor Jane from a, from a, from an econ department, or business school, from business the school, okay, business okay. perspective, 
the Chinese engage global capitalist network deeply. For example, the silver, we talk about silver, Wu Bingjian, so rich, right? Uh, but the silver, they flow to China, flow to China in a large quantity from, Max, uh, from, uh, from American side, from uh, America, uh, Peru, Mexico, the so-called New World. 70% of silver in America was transported to China, 70% of silver. And another silver producer, Japan. Japan silver also flowed a lot to Chinese market because the kind of a cross-border international capitalist network connecting China, Korea Peninsula, uh, uh, and Nagasaki, Japan. So this is a highly global network. And all the pictures actually had been neglected or covered, hidden by the open wall and by our uh, later reconstructed historiography because we deliver such a history. After open war, everything changed and then China was modernized. Uh, therefore, we've forgotten that before that moment, China had deeply in the same percent globalization, the trade as we showed, right? The tea trade connecting China, Fujian province with, with UK, with New England. And certainly there's another part I didn't mention today uh, connecting China, Yunnan, Yunnan China, Inner China, Mongolian area, Siberia, Moscow. It's overland to trade. So, so from that perspective, uh, we would have a very different pictures of a modern China. So thank you so much, John. This is a really good question. Thank, thank you so much. Well, thank you. <laughs> Professor John, would you like to respond? Or was, was it okay? Uh, one is uh, it will be too long and too sophisticated until I am not fully prepared. Yeah, I, I need okay. to study. Thank you. All right, all right. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll save the com the rest of the conversation. Maybe after the after the lecture, if you have more comments, you could um, directly com communicate with uh, Dr. Wang. So. Um, Okay, so um, we still have a few minutes, a few more minutes. Um, let me see if, if there are any questions coming in from the audience. Please don't be shy. I know our students are um, shy sometimes. <laughs> no more. <laughs> Is there if any U.S.-China yes. relations course in, in... I have no idea. It, anyone? taking any courses related to the US-China relations course? If there are anyone that would be interesting, it would be interesting to have a conversation with Dr. Wang. But if You're not, welcome. while you guys are still thinking about your uh, questions, I will take advantage of my role as, uh, as the moderator today. <laughs> I will ask my questions. Um, very simple. I have two questions. The first one, so we um, we know that there is a concept or ideas of the hierarchy of civilizations existing, right, in the right. West side. Um, but I wasn't very clear how that worked in terms of the changing of the Westerners' perception of the Chinese people. In your lecture, it was mentioned that there was a shift, hmm. right, previously the Chinese people were regarded highly, but then right, it was ch right. it changed. So I was wondering if the hierarchy of civilizations worked as a, like a theory. So the Westerners had this theory and then when they went to China, they kind of reinforced this theory or if it worked as a discourse, which means um, it got formulated while in, during their encounter with the Chinese people. So I was mm -hmm. just curious about the, change of their attitude or perceptions of the Chinese people? That was my first question. And the second question was about the um, extraterritorial, I can never say this word, um, yeah, extraterritoriality. Extra yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, so you mentioned about the end of it, right, in China mm. in 1943. Yes. So I believe that after that, especially after the, the uh, establishment of uh, People's Republic of China, um, the U.S. or any other foreign countries no longer enjoy this type of extraterritoriality in China. 
But um, you also mentioned that it was not an independent event at the time, because as you showed us, um, it also happened in Japan, in Korea, in Southeast mm. uh, Asia at the mm. time in the 19th century. My question is nowadays, for example, because my field is Japan studies, I know that still the United States still enjoy this kind of extraterritoriality in Okinawa, right. for example, the US base, military base, right? So mm -hmm. my question is, do you think um, it has changed the format? It's no longer called extraterritoriality because it's not no longer right to have it in nowadays uh, world, but has it changed the format and continue to exist? Because we can, as we can see it, it does in reality, mm -hmm. right? So right. that was my second question. Sorry, it took long. Sure, thank you, Those are good questions. Well, starting from the second one. So uh, I believe, I, I agree with you actually, the actual reality is still being practiced in Okinawa basis and, uh, and uh, that one, the, the one we visited many years ago. Yokosuka. Uh, Yokohama. Yokohama. No, no, Yokosuka. Yokosuka. Oh, the Yokosuka. Yokosuka. Right. Mm. So the Yokosuka base and uh, Okinawa base. So this, this from military perspective, and they certainly have martial law there. So this uh, applied to American GIs residing in other countries. In, in Korea, the same, in Kimpak, and uh, in, in Germany, I believe. So the, the, this is kind of typical extraterritoriality uh, practice cases. So I, I don't think the nature changed. It's actually the same, just to mm -hmm. take a different way. If you understand the... Uh, Yokosuka or Okinawa basis as settlements, pretty much it's the same, right? Yeah. Because yeah. nobody really resides in their in their residential halls. It's just the USGIs. Yeah. And uh, that we, we, if we regard that as settlements, and it's certainly exempt from Japanese and Korean law. So this is a typical one, extraterritoriality. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that I think the uh, this thing has been criticized by many Japanese scholars. Mm -hmm. And from time to time, we can see demonstrations when they occur. People also uh, yield that the full sovereignty. So Japan, mm -hmm. from the, the international law perspective, Japanese and Korean sovereignty uh, are not complete. I mean, is not intact mm -hmm. because partly the damage exactly by the American very existence in this country. Even Canada, actually, is not actual mm -hmm. reality. But uh, if you fly to Toronto, you can see the U.S. actually set up customers in the airport, but this is mm -hmm. a Canadian territory. <laughs> so this is against the Chinese law, that the Chinese understanding of this thing. So in reality, we would, we would say, yes, the American military presence uh, in those countries still practice this very extraterritoriality. Uh, this is mm -hmm. kind of a World War II uh, consequences for the U.S. Mm -hmm. because Jap Japan later in 19th century, in the early 20th century, they relinquished this right. They negotiated treaties. However, after 1945, because occupation, and then they mm -hmm. came back. It's mm -hmm. very unfortunate mm -hmm. the Japanese. Mm -hmm. and the many mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. So go back to the first question about the Western change of, of a Chinese image. Uh, mm -hmm. It also has a gradual process. Mm -hmm. So related to the Jesus missionaries I mentioned, Okay. So the Jesuits from late 16th century to late 18th century, they kept sending back to Europe reports about Chinese empire. And they only mentioned the good part of China because their, their objective mm. was to encourage European counterparts, their countrymen to come to, uh, to, to China to, per, to promote the church business, right? To spread the goods path. That's their major mission. They barely talk about the better part of Chinese society. So in their report, China was a so beautiful country. It's managed by the sand and managed by the law. But the Chinese stuff, by the way, also very popular. The silk, all the gesture, the culture. So the rosy China image uh, was, mm. was there in Europe. Well, but then after, uh, in the late 18th century, especially after the, the French Revolution, actually. Mm. So the being progress became a mainstream. And mm. uh, even before that, right, intellectuals also criticized monarchy. 
And I think mm. they are not criticizing monarchy in their own country, right? Like, like Montesquieu. They would not criticize the French king directly. So he used the Chinese case, uh, make Chinese case a two, through which he criticized his own monarchy. So in this case, he took part of Chinese emperorship as a really negative baptistic regime, and then depreciate the Chinese model. Therefore, in this way, he depreciated the French model, the monarchy. Uh, but back then, many people did not really believe in this or, or were convinced by this. However, after French Revolution, things changed. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then after Opium War, everything changed. This is about the okay. John question. Uh, when mm -hmm. European colonial power started dominating the global market and uh, the international law penetrated the local, local foreign policy network, mm -hmm. like the the international law, right, eventually introduced to China, Korea, and Japan. So the mm. com compromise, the local one were compromised and they had to follow the European laws. Therefore, mm -hmm. according to their standards, their civilization, their judgment, China, just like Korea, Japan, India, all the other countries belong to the less civilized, uh, civilized uh, peer. And mm -hmm. this is what mm -hmm. happened from the mid uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the 18th century to the mid 19th century. That's why later all these countries became so called a white burden mm. by the end of 19th mm. century. Right? This is uh, this, uh, the long process. Yeah. I see. I see. That helped a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. I think we are a little bit over time, but if anyone has any questions, um, we can take maybe one more. But if not, feel free to contact the organizers of the event or contact um, Professor Wang if you have any comments or questions. Or if you're interested in any part of um, you know, his PowerPoint, right? I believe you can uh, share maybe um, some of the visual aids again. I love those uh, visual aids. Okay, yeah, so- Just email um, me. Yeah, just please just email um, Dr. Wang. Okay, so I- um, if there are no other questions, I would like to conclude today's event. So please join me thanking um, Professor Wang again for your wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.